Brothers, this morning I will ask you to turn in your Bibles to the 91st Psalm, please. Psalm 91. Let's hear now the living voice of God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil will be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The Apostle Paul reminds us that Scripture has been given to us by inspiration. It is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. I ask you now, brothers, as we bow in prayer, that you will ask that God will send His Holy Spirit to work in all those ways in our lives. To reprove us and to correct us and to guide us and to teach us that we might be men of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We come to you this morning because we are such needy men. We are weak. We need your strength. You have promised that those who wait upon the Lord will discover that their strength is renewed. Do that today, we pray. Come, O Lord, and feed us the bread of life. Pour out your spirit upon us to reprove us and to correct us and to instruct us. Lead us, O Lord, in the paths of righteousness today for your name's sake. To that end, we pray that there will be a very real sense of your presence resting upon us. To that end, O Lord, grant the unction of the Spirit of God for the preaching and hearing of Holy Scripture. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Elizabeth Elliot wrote the biography of her husband Jim, she drew its title from the opening words of this psalm, Shadow of the Almighty. Jim Elliot was a man who knew God. He walked with God. He spent time in the secret place of the Most High, and as I'm sure most, if not all of you know the story, he gave his life for the spread of the gospel. 
His biography has been a tool that the Lord has used in the lives of countless Christians to encourage them in their own walk and service for Christ. I think one of the most compelling and inspiring aspects of Eliot's life is the way he faced trials with an utter submission to the will of God, coupled with a deep confidence in his union with Christ. In 1949, he wrote, Overcome anything in confidence of your union with Him. Now it is that confidence that is the thrust of Psalm 91. Perhaps you know someone who exudes confidence. Uh, you can see it uh, in their behavior, in their demeanor, even, even in their gait. Psalm 91 exudes confidence, but we don't see it in the psalmist's swagger. We see it in his focus upon God. We aren't sure who wrote this psalm. You'll note that it has no superscript. We aren't aware of a particular historical circumstance that gave rise to it. But its message is clear. The author wants us to know that the Lord is a refuge for His people. The Lord is a place of shelter, a place of safety where you and I may abide. But we are not supposed to just know this as an abstract theological principle. The psalmist doesn't reveal it to us so that we may discuss it and dissect it and debate it. This passage of Scripture is here for us to experience. The psalmist wants us to engage with this truth that God is our shelter and respond to it by basking in the assurance that it provides for us. He wants us to know for ourselves that when we have sought refuge in God, when we are abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, then brothers, we can have the confidence of God's saving and protecting power. Now this confidence works its way out in the psalm in three movements. And that's what I want you to see this morning. The first movement is in verses 1 and 2, where we have the confidence we confess. The confidence we confess. Now, these two verses are not merely the introduction to the psalm. They lay a theological foundation from which the remainder of this passage builds and flows and grows and expands. The confession of this psalm is built upon these two verses. And it begins with a doctrinal declaration. The psalmist speaks to anyone who has ears to hear, and he says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, if you grew up as I did with the authorized version, you probably have verse 1 stuck in your head a little bit differently. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And I actually like that translation better. The secret place, of course is the sheltering place of God. It is the place He hides us for safety. 
when the Ten Boom family wanted to rescue Jewish people from the threat of the Nazis, they built in their home the hiding place, a secret place, because only as they secreted those dear people away, only as they were hidden from harm, would they be safe. And it is this secret place of the Lord, the shelter where His shadow falls. Now what did it mean for this psalmist or for any believer in the Old Testament era to seek shelter and safety in God's secret place or to be under His shadow? To ask the question another way, Where was it in the Old Testament that God most displayed, most made known and revealed His presence? It was in the tabernacle and then in the temple. In the Holy of Holies, the most secret of all of God's secret places. In the tabernacle that was erected under the shadow of the Shekinah glory cloud. And under that cloud of glory, shadowing and shading the tabernacle, there was that most secret place. And in that most secret place, there were outstretched wings casting a shadow over the mercy seat. And brothers, that is where the believer in the Old Testament found his shelter and his safety and his security. There's a problem. By saying that, we have to remember that no average Israelite was allowed to enter into that place. He had to stand at a distance and look on. Only the high priest could go in, and only once a year. So the Israelite who wanted to seek his shelter and his safety in God had to do so by faith in what that high priest was doing. He had to trust in the work that was done for him. And when he did, he found security and protection and safety for his soul. Now, the temple is no longer standing in Jerusalem. If you visit the Temple Mount today, you will notice that there are warning signs posted by the chief rabbinate of Jerusalem. Warning faithful Jews not to visit the Temple Mount. Now, when I first saw that, it was completely counterintuitive to me. I would think that a a faithful Jewish believer from their context would want to be at the Temple Mount, would want to see that as the most sacred place. Well, that's actually just the issue. They're not supposed to go to the Temple Mount because with the Temple destroyed, we don't know where the Holy of Holies was. And so they might encounter that space to their own detriment. How sad that is. I could enjoy my visit to the Temple Mount. Because I knew that God was no longer concentrating, as it were, His presence in one location. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that God has abandoned His people or abandoned His covenant or left being in the midst of His chosen ones. But it means that now... The temple is no longer needed because God has come to us in the person of His incarnate Son. Jesus has come to us. So for us, brothers, we can summarize this wonderful truth of of verse 1 that, that God's sheltering and protective presence is found for us in that succinct Pauline phrase, in Christ. In Christ. 
union with Christ is absolutely essential to our communion with God. We heard that yesterday in the reference to that wonderful John Murray book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Union is foundational for our communion with Christ, and you cannot reverse the two. You cannot hope through acts of devotion to attempt communion with God with the hopes of arriving some state at which you will eventually be united to Christ. But it is out of this joy of being in union with the Son of God, of being in the secret place of the Most High, of abiding in the shadow of the Almighty, that you can then pursue communion with God, knowing that you're already accepted, you're already welcomed, you're already invited into His presence. And He will be with you as you seek Him. Here's the shelter of our souls, brothers. It's still the holy of holies, but not the one built with hands. Still beneath the shadow of the cherubim wings, but in that heavenly sanctuary where Jesus has entered and sprinkled His own blood on our behalf. There's our rest and there's our security. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he writes in Colossians 3, he says, if you're united with Christ, if you've been raised with Christ, it's because you have died with Him and your life is hidden. It's hidden in the secret place with Christ in God. Now, the psalmist follows this doctrinal declaration in verse 1 with a personal profession in verse 2. Based upon what he knows, based upon what he has just said, what he knows is true, he turns to address the Lord and he identifies Him in three ways. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, and my God. Now what do each of these three designations have in common? They each stress the sovereignty and the power of God. God is a refuge. You may trust in Him. God is a fortress. He is like a mountain citadel. He is impregnable. He is God. The, the same God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. Sovereign. Omnipotent. But notice, there's a second way in which these designations are tied together. They not only emphasize the sovereignty and power of God, but you find in these verses this personal association, don't you? This personal linking of the psalmist to God. It's not just God is a refuge or a fortress or a God or even the God, but no, He is mine. If you shelter in the secret place of the Most High, you can claim this God to be yours. You can say with the Shulamite, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am safe. After identifying God in these three ways, he says he's the one in whom I trust. Here's an expression of ongoing personal commitment and faith in the Lord. It's wonderful, brothers, to look back on our lives and to recount the ways that God has worked, the way that He moved in our lives to bring us to faith, the way He's led us uh, to our various callings, the way He's provided for us. Marvelous. We need to tell our testimonies. But it does no good for us to simply talk about what God has done in our lives. Our testimonies need to be up to date because faith is active. Faith is living if it is true and real faith. And our commitment to Christ is not just something from the past. 
but it must be a lively experiential commitment every day. You are my God. You are the one in whom I trust. Faith must be a lively, growing, deepening experience. Now, brothers, when we look at these first two verses, we, we have to tie them together. We must tie them together. We must never allow this doctrinal declaration in verse 1 to merely be a matter for debate. Because truth demands commitment. The theology we preach from our pulpits must be the theology we live in our homes. Our doctrine must be wedded to life. It's one thing to be an orthodox confessional Calvinist. It's wonderful. I are one. I am a card-carrying, confessional, and by mid-morning, fully caffeinated Calvinist. Fantastic. But that isn't enough. It's one thing to be a confessional Calvinist. It's another thing to walk with and worship God and abide in His presence. Brothers, we are called to herald the message of verse 1. We are called to proclaim Jesus Christ as the shelter and safety and only hope that mankind has. We are to preach that to our people. We are to proclaim that gospel to the world. We are to not just speak it, not just tell it. We are to herald it, proclaim it. But it will ring hollow if it is not wedded to an experiential faith and a personal profession of a lively growing and deepening experience of Christ. Perhaps some of you know Timothy Dudley Smith's hymn based on Psalm 91, safe in the shelter of the Lord beneath His hand and power. I trust in Him. I trust in Him my fortress, and my tower. Brother, it's, brothers, it's only where solid theology is wedded to vital experience that there will be effective ministry. But this is the confidence we confess. Now that reality leads us to look at a second movement in this psalm. In verses 3 through 13. Here we discover the confidence we proclaim. Now you're going to notice that, that a shift occurs in the text at verse 3. We begin in verse 1 with the third person. He, anyone who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Then we move to the first person in verse 2. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God. Now beginning at verse 3 and moving down all the way through verse 13, the focus is on the second person. The second person singular. You. Now the question is, to whom is the psalmist speaking? To himself? Or someone else. Jones's classic spiritual depression. One of the greatest pieces of counsel that he gives. Is that we should sit down and talk to ourselves. Too often we listen to ourselves. And we need to just sit down. And give ourselves a good theological lecture. 
Soul, you have taken refuge in God. Soul, you are in the shadow of the Almighty, therefore. Is that what the psalmist is doing? Or is he addressing someone else? Is this a priest or a king addressing another faithful Israelite? Well, I'm going to cop out and say the answer is yes. But I know that from experience because we preach better to others, we preach best to others when we first preach to ourselves. So what does the psalmist have to say? As you work your way from verse 3 down through verse 13, you'll notice that he compiles image after image to tell us, to assure us, that if we trust in God, He will deliver us, He will protect us, He will be our defense, and we may walk in victory. Now, notice how this unfolds here. First of all, in verses 3 through 8, we are assured here that the Lord will deliver us. The Lord will deliver you, and He will protect you, so that you need not fear. Now, in compiling this catalog of images, the psalmist takes us on a journey. And he begins in the forest. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will deliver you from the bird trap. I follow on Instagram an account called Awesome Animals. Uh, it, it is a lot of fun. People post little videos of very fascinating creatures and funny things that happen with them. Yesterday, there was a video of a bird trap. Now, this trap was made uh, of a basket, and it was propped up with a stick waiting for an unsuspecting bird to make its way under it. It was baited with some breadcrumbs, and then... You spring the trap, and it's captured. But it was a very obvious trap, and in fact, so obvious that these birds were wary of it. And a pair of them come up to the trap, and they see the bread, and the bread is tempting, but they see the trap. And so one of them goes in and gets the bread and brings it back out to the other. And that happens repeatedly, protecting the other bird. And you want to look at that, and if you didn't know they were just operating by instinct, you'd think, isn't that sweet? That's just so sweet. Although, as I thought about it, it's probably the female going in and getting the bread for the male. That's probably how it was working. But they were wary because the trap was obvious. The problem with a snare is that it's hidden. And that's its danger. It's secreted away. And it is deadly. Snares are laid to trap the unsuspecting. And brother, you can be sure Satan has set a snare for you. Nothing he would love more than to destroy your ministry. If he can pull you down, he can wipe out the congregation. But knowing that should not make us paranoid. It should make us circumspect. It should make us wise. And it should make us trust with confidence in this God who will deliver you from the snare of the fowl. How does he do that? Well, don't we often resort to that wonderful promise of 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. There's your confidence. He will not let you be tempted above what you are able, but with the temptation provide a way of escape. What's that way of escape? It's fleeing to the shadow of the Almighty. It's getting back to the secret place. It's flying to Christ. And prayerfully applying the power of His cross to your temptation. And you're delivered by His grace. 
Hidden and deadly dangers are all around us. But our confidence is in Him. Next, the psalmist moves from the forest and, and the field to the barnyard. We're told that He will cover you with His pinions. Under His wings you will find refuge. That, that wonderful image that is repeated a number of times in Scripture that God, like a mother hen, gathers us tenderly, lovingly, protecting and, and caring for us. But then the psalmist quickly moves from the barnyard to the battlefield. God is our shield and our buckler. He is ready to defend us. And therefore you have no fear. Not of the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day. The pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes in noonday. You need not fear. The dangers you can see are the ones that you can't. Because God is there to protect you. He doesn't work nine to five and take bank, take bank holidays. This is comprehensive coverage. There isn't fine print to verses three through eight. There's no out clause. God says, I will be there for you. He will deliver you and He will protect you so that you need not fear. It's with assurance in God's power that we can have confidence and courage to face this dark world. And brothers, I don't have to talk to you about the day and age in which we live. You're talking to your people about it because you're well aware. More and more, it is taking greater and greater courage to stand up and name the name of Jesus Christ. And pretty soon, people are going to be arrested in this country because it's going to be a hate crime. It's going to be a hate crime to say Jesus' name. You're just wanting to oppress me, talking to me about the gospel. That's all you want to do. You want to cramp my style. How are we going to face this ever-darkening hour with courage and with boldness? Only as we have confidence in our God. Confidence breeds courage. I don't think there's anyone outside of Holy Scripture who illustrates that better than John Knox. The great thundering Scot. The trumpeter of God. When he died and Regent Morton attended his funeral, he stood at the great Scottish reformer's grave and he said, Here lies one who neither flattered nor feared any flesh. Are we going to be courageous men? If we are going to approach the dangers that we face with this kind of confidence and courage, then we must be men who dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You'll notice then in verses 9 through 13 that the Lord not only delivers you and protects you so that you need not fear, but the Lord will protect you and keep you so that you walk in victory. The psalmist moves from the battlefield to the campground. Look at verses 9 and 10. Because you've made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to, uh, to befall you. No plague come near your tent. The campground is safe. But then he moves from the campground to the mountain path. He will command his angels, verse 11, he will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And while you're out walking in the mountains, you don't have to be afraid of the lions or the snakes either, because you will tread on the lion and the adder and the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. 
Now, brothers, as we pause for a moment here at the end of verse 13, and we look back at these marvelous, marvelous words of assurance that that you and I are to proclaim, we can do so with great joy, can't we? God will deliver us from the snare of the fowler. Yes, He is able to give us grace to mortify our temptations and our sins. Hallelujah. But if we think about these verses seriously for a few moments, we'll have to ask ourselves, are we going a bit too far? Are we stepping over the line? Are we claiming too much? No plague come near your tent? No evil befall you? If that's the case, it seems that the title of Elizabeth Elliot's biography of Jim is tragically ironic. Because a plague certainly came near their tent and evil befell their house. He and his companions did not escape the spears that flew by day. What are we to make of this? And what about verses 11 and 12? You'll recognize those as the ones Satan quoted in his second temptation of the Lord Jesus. When he took him to Jerusalem, to the pinnacle of the temple, just throw yourself down. God's promised his angels will protect you. But Jesus himself said, don't tempt the Lord your God. Jesus himself knew that that harm could befall a believer. You can say, hey, I'm a man of God and walk out in front of a, a moving bus. Well, you may have been a man of God before you stepped out in front of it, but now you're just a flattened fool. Harm does come to the people of God. The people of God suffer. That's blatantly obvious. So what are we to make of this? How are we to read this passage? How are we to to preach this passage and, and these confident assertions? Brothers, I believe we must do so from two perspectives. The first is the perspective of godly living. The Lord has designed every tragedy in our lives, every illness, every ache and pain, every loss, every heartache, not to destroy us, but to refine us and to make us like Jesus. He works all things together for good to them that love God. What is the good? You have to read beyond Romans 8, 28. Because verse 29 tells us it's to make us like Christ. That's the good. I wonder if the Apostle Paul had the soundtrack of Psalm 91 playing in his mind when he wrote Romans 8. God has designed our trials to refine us. So that we cannot look upon any of the dangers that we face and the harm that we suffer as really ultimate harm at all. I don't know of anyone who has expressed this better than Spurgeon. When he said, it is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten his reward. Ill to him is no ill. Listen to this. This is one of the most profound sentences I have ever read. Ill to him is no ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. And death is his gain. Brothers, we must preach 
these promises confidently from the perspective of godly living. Sanctification, that's a a soteriological perspective. But we must also, I believe, preach these promises from the perspective of expectant living. Satan quoted verses 11 and 12 to Jesus in Jerusalem. And I wonder, I wonder what look Christ had on his face. I don't think he probably laughed, but I wonder if there was a smirk. A smirk at Satan cherry-picking this passage. Because you see, he stopped short of verse 13. Had he quoted it, he would have only been referring to his own demise. Because the God who rescues us, the God who sends his angels as ministering spirits to minister to us, the heirs of salvation, it is that God who in the person of his Son treads the serpent underfoot. You know these Biblical images of the lion and the adder. You understand the theological significance of this imagery. It reaches all the way back to where we were yesterday morning in Genesis 3.15. The seed of a woman who crushes the serpent's head. You see the eschatological perspective from which we read these promises. That what God is laying before us this morning is our ultimate hope. He has us on a road of progressing sanctification, a road toward godliness, but that road ends in glory. In glory. This glory, this victory began on the cross when Christ defeated His foe. And Paul writes to the church at Rome and to us that soon we are going to enjoy that victory. Soon, he says in Romans 16.20, the God of peace will crush Satan under your foot. And that's the confidence you can have, brothers. Now the question is, where do we gain these perspectives? We gain them in the secret place. In the shadow of the Almighty. We gain them, brothers, in the personal place of prayer and communion with God. When we take all of the ills that we face, the losses, the pain, the heartache, and we pour it out in confident submission, just the way Jim Elliott would do, in submission to the goodness of God and in confidence of our union with Christ. And we say, O Lord, work in me and work through me. And give me that vision, Lord, that all of this pain and suffering will one day come to an end. Give me that eschatological perspective so that we can then rise from our knees and we can herald with our voices. No evil shall befall you. No plague come near your tent. The Lord is your refuge and your strength. Brothers, this is the confidence we proclaim. But there is a a third movement, a third shift in the text in verses 14 through 16. Another grammatical shift in the text. We switch back now to the first person, but it isn't the psalmist who's speaking. It is the Lord Himself. And here we have the confidence that we enjoy. We are to bask in this confidence, not just confess it, and grit our teeth and say, I, I know it's true, I don't feel it, I know it's true, I'm going to say it. We're supposed to enjoy this. 
How do we enjoy it? Well, we first of all enjoy it through the Word of God. Look at verse 14 again. Because He holds fast to me in love, I will deliver Him. I will protect Him. I will answer Him. I will be with Him in trouble. I will rescue Him and honor Him. With long life, I will satisfy Him and I will show Him my salvation. Eight first-person expressions. This is what God's going to do. God has committed Himself, brothers, to be for us. And He who spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not also with Him freely give us all things? What we proclaim and preach is simply what God says, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it. We enjoy this confidence through the Word of God, through basking in the Word of God, through immersing ourselves in the Word. I'm a Presbyterian, but this is the only immersion I really am kind of in favor of. <laughs> immersing ourselves, soaking ourselves, going down deep, To meditate. To feed our souls. To hear these words from God. Not just as expressions of Hebrew syntax. You ought to start there. But you ought to hear them as His living voice. Spoken to you as His dear Son. That's how you enjoy this confidence. It's enjoyed through communion with God. Look, look who enjoys it. It's the one who holds fast to God in love. This is the same expression the Lord uses in Deuteronomy 7.7 7, when He tells Israel, you know, you weren't the biggest people around. You weren't the flashiest. But I love you. I'm going to hold fast to you in love. And we then, in turn, brothers, hold fast to Him. We love Him because He first loved us. And isn't this the essence of our communion? Isn't this the way John Owen defined it for us? That we receive grace from God, and then in turn we express those graces that He works in us back to God. He loves us. We receive His love. And then we turn right back around and we say, Oh gracious God, I love you. You loved me to death. Let me be willing to give my life for you. We enjoy this confidence when we are holding fast to Him with a never-dying commitment and devotion. of Deep affection. Where our hearts are moved to say again with that Shulamite, I am my beloved. And He is mine. It's for the one who knows God's name. I will protect him, he says, because he knows my name. We don't just know to call God Jesus or Jehovah or Yahweh or Father, Son and Spirit. It's not just having the correct label as important as that is. I don't want to diminish that. But it's knowing his character. Brothers, you can't know the character of God without getting on your knees before your Bible and praying this word into your heart and then getting up and suffering. That's the only way. That is the only way. There's no other way but trials and temptations faced with an open Bible and a bent knee to know the character of the Almighty. You can't know the name of this God. You can't know what He's really like just by reading the table of contents in Charnock. You've got to be wedded to the Word. And you've got to suffer. 
There's no shortcut. But God will deliver the one who knows his name. And then he says, the one who calls on me, I'll answer. I believe when we think of communion with God, prayer is probably the first thing we think about. That's not a bad thing because, remember Calvin said, prayer is the principal and perpetual expression of faith. So you can't commune with God without praying. And when you pray, he says, I will answer. And brothers, as pastors and elders, we are called to proclaim this truth. As we personally confess it and stand to herald it. But we are also to enjoy it. You know the stereotypical dour Calvinist, right? He looks like he eats lemons for breakfast. The sourpuss, the grave and somber, afraid to crack a smile, his face might shatter. How tragic. How tragic is that stereotype? You know, people ought to look at us and say, that's the happiest Christian I know. He must be a Calvinist. <laughs> he must really believe in the sovereignty of God. He must really believe that God's got this under control. Do you? And do you delight in that truth? That he is your refuge, your fortress? And your God? Is that your confidence? God is our fortress, brothers. This is a Hebrew word I'm sure all of you know. Metsuda. We've anglicized it as Masada. If you've ever stood atop that wilderness fortress of Herod the Great then you know that you can see for miles and miles in every direction in the Judean wilderness. It's the ideal fortress. You can't sneak up on someone who's at Masada. You can see them coming for miles. And the Romans only overthrew Masada in AD 70 because they played the long game and built a siege ramp against the western wall. For some time, soldiers in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, would make their way to the top of Masada for their swearing-in ceremony. There they would take their oath, which included in part, Masada shall never fall again. Brothers, our Masada has never fallen. And he never will. He has taken an oath himself to assure it. And that, brothers, is a confidence we can confess, a confidence we can proclaim, and hallelujah, it is a confidence we can enjoy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for who our Savior is. We thank you for the shelter of the Most High and the shadow of the Almighty. We thank you that we are enfolded in the arms of Jesus. Wrapped around us are those hands that were pierced with nails. Holding us tightly are those arms that will never let us go. May we, O oh Lord, learn to enjoy, to bask in, and to be heralds of this assurance, this confidence that Christ is our fortress, our surety, our stronghold, our rock. 
our mighty God. We ask this in his name. Amen.